Hello everyone and welcome back to day 55 of Bitwise where we code a complete software hardware stack, very simple computer from scratch. More uh, hardware design stuff, logic design stuff today. Um, first, let's finish off uh, very quickly with uh, the topic at the end of, uh, of yesterday's long stream. Um, so if you recall, what we did on stream was we, we built the funnel shifter and then we built sort of individual kinds of shift and rotations uh, out of that. Uh, and what was remaining, which I decided to punt to today, um, because I didn't think it was necessarily uh, the most important part of, of the exercise, um, was to just combine them like we did for the shift, uh, for the barrel uh, shifter into a unified structure that has uh, the input muxes to prepare the, the right, you know, uh, double width funnel operand to the funnel shifter to compute these different operations. So that's what I did. Um, this is what the code ends up being. There's a test case that runs the same exhaustive tests for all the five different operations that we use with the barrel shifter. Um, if you compare this to each of the previous things, it's really um, very straightforward, like just factoring out the similarities and differences. Uh, the one thing that I did in order to uh, handle this more cleanly is if you just look naively at, the, at these patterns, you might think that uh, you want to split uh, things into two parts and then concatenate them, but there's some off by one stuff um, in the middle um, that, uh, or, or there's some, yeah, it, it just turns out to be easier to sort of uh, split it into a low part, a high part, and then a uh, with one, a single bit mid part, uh, because the this turns out to be the same whether you're doing uh, rotation or shifting, whether you're doing uh, arithmetic or, or logical right shifting, just dependent on the direction. Uh, so this is sort of an, you can see there's a, a pre-shift difference in these two cases. But anyway, uh, that's uh, that's what that was. So that was sort of a uh, unclosed, uh, or what do you call it, an open thread from last time that's been closed. Um, I also put in, I think I mentioned that the sort of naive way of doing a shifter unit is to just do the different operations and put a simple-minded mux around it, which is honestly probably what we're going to end up doing for the FPJ core we eventually... We eventually do. I mean, we're going to compare them, but um, in the past when I tried, that was what ended up being the winner, and that is simpler. So I also have an example of that here, which uh, doesn't do rotation, although it could, um, but since we're not going to, I think it's called simple shifter unit, right? So here's a simple shifter unit, and this is really as simple-minded as it gets. There's a left shifter, and there's a right shifter. The right shifter uh, takes an arithmetic bit, uh, which it uses to... I have both the Radix 2 and 4 version, which it just uses, uh, it's the same sort of logarithmic cascade we've seen before, but now uh, uses the, uh, well, and in fact, yeah, this is, uh, do it like that, something to do it down here, uh, which it uses to, to fill the bits that get shifted in, uh, and then you just have to mux based on the direction between those two cases, and, uh, you know, this is a very fine structure works perfectly well if these are the if those three operations are all you need um, you should definitely start by comparing to this um, you do have two independent uh, shift structures on the other hand um, the uh, the uh, the uh, there's no input mux and the output mux is extremely uh, simple so um, we, we should compare these more uh, empirically once we get to the sort of very hands-on FPGA stuff but I just wanted to show this at least. Uh, I think if you started having to do rotations on, uh, with this as well, then you would end up having a third case. Uh, the left and right rotations would probably be shared between the, a single rotator, but then you would have three cases, and maybe at that point, um, you know, the uh, the extra area uh, becomes, uh, you know, m m makes a barrel shifter or a funnel shifter uh, structure uh, preferable. But anyway, uh, I'm actually not sure about the conclusion there. We'll, we'll, we'll evaluate that empirically when we get to um, some very hands-on FPGA stuff, but I just wanted to throw that in there that I put it this in if you wanted to see what that looks like. It seems very simple. All right, um, today I wanted to cover um, multipliers and related topics. So um, this is going to be the last stream before I go to Denmark. Uh, I will resume streaming in Denmark on a, probably a fairly inverted schedule. It might not be in the rest of this week um, because we're traveling uh, in the next uh, two days, basically. and uh, and it would be nice to get settled before I have to worry about streaming. So uh, probably expect maybe a, a week's delay before streaming resumes. So this will be the last one in a while. Um, 
And uh, I think starting after this, maybe I'll do a, a, a one stream on, on dividers just to sort of round out the set of, of topics. Um, but then after that, we'll move uh, sort of from the combinational data path stuff to sequential synchronous stuff, which is more about you know how to handle state and stuff like that, how to structure state machines. Um, and uh, I've kind of intentionally covered some more advanced topics in this part of the series, just because I think this stuff is, uh, a lot of this stuff we won't end up necessarily using as is for FPGA design, just because FPGAs have hard-coded structures for a lot of these things or have certain advantages and disadvantages that make other approaches uh, preferred. But I, I consider this to be kind of basic stuff. Like if you want to know how things work, uh, you know, this is how chips are often done. Of course, more advanced, like, but you know, the, the, the kind of the recurring concepts are, are these. So um, today we're going to cover multipliers and um, the, um, for, for me, I think the biggest uh, shock, I think the biggest, well, let's see. Um, the fact that you can do really fast addition, I think was a shock when I finally understood it. Like, so we covered that before with things like parallel prefix adders, but you know, even, uh, even before I fully understood carry look ahead adders, I understood conditional sum adders. They're very simple. They're just divide and conquer with speculative kind of execution. And you can see that those are logarithmic depth, right? Uh, that's uh, very obvious. So I think I understood that um, pretty easily. But the thing that was really shocking to me was the fact that how fast multipliers can be made in hardware. Um, and so that's basically going to be today's topic. How can you... Uh, how can multipliers basically be almost as fast as adders? Um, because from a software perspective, that goes against everything you believe. Uh, you know, addition, <laughs> addition is linear in the number of bits in terms of the amount of work. Uh, hardware is quadratic in the amount of uh, work. Like when I say work here, I don't mean the critical path in a parallel execution. I mean the amount of, you know, regardless of how you schedule them, there's a quadratic amount of stuff that has to get done. Um, and so it's maybe a little bit shocking that not only can it be done sort of asymptotically as fast uh, as addition, but it's only a small multiple slower for a given number of bits. Uh, whereas if you think of, you know, if you think of it from a serial perspective, it's like, you know, one grows linearly, the other grows quadratically in the number of bits, which is a drastic difference. Um, but that, but that, but this basically means that if you can find a good parallel structure for a multiplier, um, as long as you're willing to spend a lot of area, I mean, like quadratic amount of area. Then um, you can basically, I mean, it'll turn out we can get logarithmic depth circuits. Uh, anyway, so we're going to explore that today. It's going to be sort of today's major topic. There's a bunch of um, uh, what do you call it? There's a a bunch of subtopics that are not just multiplier specific, but which, uh, but 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 which have recurring uses in other. Uh, other areas, and I'll kind of point those out. So I'll, I'll try to, to tangle apart things that are really multiplier specific from things that aren't. And it turns out that actually the real uh, the, the real leverage in a multiplier comes from something that, in, in some sense, has nothing to do with multiplication per se. So anyway, um, so 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 what is the basic uh, multiplier algorithm? Well, uh, let's start with just the schoolbook algorithm. So suppose you have two bit vectors, uh, uh, and I'm going to well, actually let's write them with something closer to Python notation. So suppose you have these bits uh, from least to most significant and um, and you want to multiply them. Um, if, you know, you probably learned, <laughs> hopefully you learned decimal-based uh, uh, long multiplication in, in, in school, but um, it turns out binary is even simpler, but it's the same basic idea. So you think, you take one of the operands and we will just arbitrarily um, I guess use uh, x, and then we basically take shifts of it. Um, let's see here. Maybe let me do x2, x1. So we have a couple to show the shift structure here. Um, and um, the idea is, you know, for the we basically have multiple shifted copies of that, uh, and so. Um, we have this one. Uh, I guess we need another one. Um, so we have these copies, but they have to be multiplied um, by a digit, by successive digits of the uh, of the other operand. And so this 
I guess might be a little bit. Um, so I'll, I'll write it like this. Uh, um, and then for the second row, I have this. Um, and so let's try to align them. Uh, bear with me. So, um, so, th so this is a basic long multiplication uh, matrix, right? Or a grid or whatever you want to call it. And I think you all know what you do. You calculate each of these so-called partial products. Each of them basically just corresponds to I, uh, you know, this bit times two to the I. Um, because if you think of what each of these bits mean in the original, the, the actual number y is a sum of of these uh, coefficients times the corresponding power of two. Um, and so the power of two multiplication, you basically you multiply each of these terms by the other operand. The power of two part corresponds to the shift. So this this thing here has been shifted by uh, multiplied by two, shifted by one. This has been multiplied by four, shifted by two. And then the coefficient wise part uh, is is what we're writing. But the point is the that's where this kind of comes from. It's just from, uh, you know, decomposing y as a sum of its terms, uh, and then multiplying them out, multiplying the coefficients, and then shifting that so-called partial product accordingly. So from that perspective, you can break down the the problem into two stages. Stage one is to generate this so-called partial product grid or partial product set. Um, and then, as you probably recall, you have to then add down columns because all the columns correspond to, to bits of the so-called same weight. They, they correspond to the same power of two weight in the, uh, you know, in the base two decomposition. And so, step one, construct this uh, set of, of of things, and then step two, uh, add down in columns, and uh, you know, and potentially, well, the, the way you normally write it when you're doing it by hand, and this is where things are going to be different from where you're used to is that normally you would start at the least significant bits. So you start in this column, and, uh, well, this can't produce a carry, but uh, this thing can produce a carry, and then if there is a carry, you carry it over to the next column, and so you get the carry from the previous column, add it, and then you add that into the sum of all the existing things in that column, and then you go through, and eventually you're done once you have enough bits. Um, so uh, the main thing that will differ is we'll still be adding things uh, from this partial product array, but instead of doing things serially in this kind of carry propagate way where we go down one column and compute the result there and then propagate to the next column, we're going to be using a much more parallel structure that in fact doesn't require uh, a carry propagate operation. Carry propagate is the thing we looked at earlier when we talked about um, adders. Even fast adders are so-called carry propagate adders. It basically means that you really have to propagate carries. So carry lookahead has a fast way of propagating carries, but it's nevertheless doing it. It turns out that um, using something called carry save adders, we can do basically most of the intermediate addition, all but the last, very last set of intermediate additions can be done without any carry propagation. Uh, and that's going to be the trick. But um, before we even get to that, let me just write down a very naive expression uh, where we assume that addition is available, like I'm just going to use built-in addition uh, in, in the language, um, but I'm going to break out the uh, the partial product so that even though we're relying on addition being available, we're at least expressing the partial product generation and the partial partial product accumulation manually, and then we'll verify that um, that this gives the right result for um, uh, you know relative to integer multiplication uh, in Python. So uh, that's going to be the basic idea. Yeah, no, I, I, yeah, what, what Fabian is saying, I, I've actually thought through that as well recently, which is that, yeah, anyway, well, maybe I'll talk about that when we get to it. Um, all right, um, so, so let's, uh, let's basically do what I talked about here. Um, it should be pretty straightforward. So you, you do, what, I don't know what you call it. Um, let's, let's maybe call, uh, let's write a function called partial products. And uh, all it's going to do is it's going to, it doesn't really matter which of them you, you, you treat as the thing you're shifting or whatever. Um, but um, I mean, maybe you can say for y, i, n, y, let's call it b. For b and y, um, 
can actually write it like this. Um, for B and Y, we are going to um, we're going to. So uh, I guess I should mention one reason that uh, binary multiplication is very nice is that multiplication in binary just corresponds to AND, right? Because you have only zero and one. If you multiply by zero, you get zero. If two things are multiplied, if two ones are multiplied, you get one. So that behaves exactly like AND. So uh, this digit-wise product is just uh, bit-wise AND. Um, YJ. Um, For x i and x, for y j in y, um, and then this have to be has to be shifted over by um, by j. It's kind of a straightforward way of writing it. So this gives us uh, n partial products if you have n bits. Um, I guess let's just verify that they have the same length, just in case we have a mistake. I'm going to catch it before it has some downstream effect. Um, uh, let's call this a naive multiplier. Um, so what we're going to do is we're going to uh, generate the partial products uh, of, of these operands, and uh, then we're just going to add them. And so I'm going to say P is, um, we can take the first element of it. Well. Actually, let me just write this as a reduce. So we already have binary reduce. Um, I guess this is not necessarily, well, let's, we, we can use it. Uh, really, we're looking to just sum them. Uh, in fact, I, you can even, I think you can even use the built-in <laughs> You can even use the built-in Python sum function, which will do something linear. So, but, but let me let me actually do that just to show show the idea, um, kind of declaratively. So, what is it complaining about? So it didn't parenthesize it correctly. Okay. Um, let's just comment these old tests out while we work with our new tests. Um, okay, so then we need a, uh, uh, we need a simple test module as before. And note that we're only going to output as many bits as there are input bits. We're not going to op uh, output a double width operand. If you want to do that, um, it, I mean, at least in this simple-minded case, all you have to do basically is <clears throat> You just have to, well, uh, zero extend basically. If you zero extend the operands uh, by n bits before you do all these things, then it will just work. Um, it, which might not be well, d depending on what happens downstream in the logic synthesis flow, uh, that may or may not produce good results. Like it, depending on how good it, the downstream stuff is at dealing with uh, these sort of concatenated zeros, and in terms of realizing the implications of how stuff can be simplified as a result. But anyway, uh, we're just doing this. Uh, Simple-minded uh, n, n times n bit gives uh, n bits of output. So um, let's call it p. Uh, so this is going to be um, this is the product of these two. So that's thirty-three. <clears throat> um, and so actually, it will turn out. Maybe I'll demonstrate this. It'll turn out. Um, that at least for this version, it shouldn't matter whether you have signed or unsigned, uh, because you're never looking at the high bits um, for the for when you only output the the lower half bits of the result. So anyway, um, example 33, evaluate x y, um, and then you want to you want to verify that this corresponds to you know uh, masked multiplication. So let's try this. That doesn't work. Zero times zero, hopefully is zero. Um, but it claims that p. Oh wait, we have to extract the output we care about. Okay, one times two, which is two. Let's make sure that Python does the right thing. 
and it says, says it's zero. So okay, so let's just go and look at what we're doing up here. And actually, let's since we're using the sum function, um, let's just verify. Uh, I'm sure it's a simple little bug, but let me just show you that that even though it's using the built-in sum function, because it eventually defers to our uh, operator overload, it should actually do the reasonable thing. Uh, well, reasonable in this case meaning probably a linear chain of additions. <clears throat> But yeah, you can see there's a linear chain of additions for these partial products. Um, four bits of input, four bits of output. Okay, so let's uh, let's look at what this where the bug is. Um, so we have this entry-wise thing. Oh, uh, that's really dumb. It should be out here. Okay, so now it works. Um, so yeah, so this is just the direct implementation. Uh, actually, let me just just to maybe to to prove the point. I will cover simple ways of handling unsigned stuff. But if you do this, this should also actually work. Um, So that's something that I guess not everyone maybe has thought through, but if you look at, um, I think this is true for Risk Five as well. If uh, there's Risk Five doesn't have uh, a double, a direct way to get a double width a product of two single width registers. Um, so there's mall, and then there's mall H and mall H U. There's no mall U. There's no, you know, be, be, meaning mall for signed and unsigned is the same for the low bits because basically the sign bit only comes into play you can just look at it if you do the if you sign extend the operands and you see where they can affect things um, it's only in the upper half so if you truncate that and only take the lower half um, it's there, there's only one operation uh, for both unsigned and signed twos complement but when you get to the high bits uh, it matters whether you zero extend or sign extend of course so uh, just a quick note so um, on that <clears throat> All right, so uh, that's well, and, and actually, I mean, again, I, I don't want you to think that our <laughs> our simple delay thing is going to be very representative of, of real stuff. But I let's at least get it this into the mix because I think it's at least it's going to show you some things uh, in this case. So uh, let's see what we get for this one. Um, It's, I guess it's not really, well, um, oh, it should be 33 as well. Okay. It's actually pretty high for only being a 4-bit shifter, if you think about it. Do you remember, well, like, a single 64-bit addition was like 20-ish uh, with their fast parallel prefix adders. This is a 4-bit multiplier, um, and it's not very fast already. So, um, uh, Instead of this, like this is maybe too naive for us to even consider uh, seriously. I don't necessarily. Uh, let's do a binary reduce of um, of addition. So th this is going to be a balanced uh, a balanced tree. Um, so you can see that still works, but now this got cut in half. It's going to be even more cut in half if we have a bigger. Um, let me try this. Like the the brute force stuff is not. Uh, let's try six at least. I think we can brute force six. Uh, all right, except all of this stuff. Eh. We probably can't finish that brute force very quickly that we'll want to have it in our test loop. But anyway, yeah. Um, this was actually not too bad. You can see that this, well, it doubles, it, it basically, it doubles with the number of um, with the number of bits, which is linear growth, which is pretty good, uh, if you if if you had a naive, excuse me, if you had a naive picture that it should double. Um, in fact, let's maybe try with uh, this one. Let's see what it does. Yeah, so you can see this more than doubled. I can't remember what it was before. Um, it was forty, right? So. Uh, so even just doing this binary reduction uh, is is decent. I should mention that I think the way I calculate uh, 
delays from these. If, if, if I mean, uh, let me put it in here. Uh, When you're using the built-in plus operator, I have like a simple model of the roughly logarithmic delay um, per bit uh, to correspond with a fast adder, um, but it's not really been calibrated. But so let's but let's just use this consistently anytime we're doing carry propagate addition. And if it turns out to be way underestimating things, actually let me um, let me just see what this is. Uh, it's obviously going to trigger the tests. So this is 15 for yeah, that's pretty slow. That's, but I think that's fine as a placeholder. Um, all right. Um, so anyway, let me put it back to something where my test, a unit test, can complete immediately. Um, all right. So uh, already, if you're doing this kind of binary reduction of the addition, it's pretty good. It's it's actually not terrible. Uh, but there's something you can do that's even better. Um, and the idea here is if you go back to, uh, it's called carry save addition, uh, uh, CSA, or CSA sometimes also stands for carry save adder, but uh, either way. Um, the idea here is go back to our add three thing. Um, add three was our, uh, was our so-called full adder. It takes three bits of the same weight. We all often think of the third being a carry, but really, it doesn't have to be. They're just three bits of the same weight. It's actually a symmetric structure, uh, even though sometimes, uh, well, in carry propagate adders, you often write it asymmetrically in a way that separates the operands from the carry input. But fundamentally, this is actually symmetric. You can think of it as taking three bits of the same weight and outputting two bits, one which is the sum bit, which has the same weight, and the next, which is the carry out, which is the, uh, you know, it's the plus one weight it has one weight it has weight uh, one higher than the inputs um so it turns out that you can use this structure um to um to build fast multi-operand adders so really the name of the game is once we've generated this partial product array what we're trying to do is we're trying to add a lot of operands in parallel and, and we're, we're trying we're, and we're going to try to avoid using uh, pairwise addition that is fully pr propagated in, with the carries. Um, and so instead what we're going to do is we're going to use uh, carry save adders, which is just going to be basically this kind of add three, but applied to each bit independently. So you take three bit vectors in, you get two bit vectors out. The first bit vector will correspond to the S uh, and the other one will correspond to the C and uh, will basically be sort of bit shifted versions of each uh, of of something, and so the basic uh, identity you end up uh, wanting is that uh, you get something like this. And again, entry-wise, it's just a full adder. And the invariant you want is that if you had done the three-way addition of the inputs, it would be the same as doing uh, this on the right-hand side. So C, C is shifted because, or you can think of it as multiplication by two. It's shifted because it has weight plus one relative to the original. Um, but the basic idea behind this identity is you can go from three operands to two operands um, without doing any carry propagation because all of these operations from the CSA primitive uh, that, that is just a, a concatenation of uh, these full adders we've been using already, uh, this thing here has constant delay. It's not logarithmic, it's constant because there's no carry chain, there's nothing. It's just literally taking the input bits in a given position and outputting two bits. Um, and so if you apply this repeatedly, you can go from three to two operands. Uh, you can't go from two to one. To go to two, from, so, so, so the trick is you can go from three to two um, and you can do that repeatedly. So if you have four things, you can go from three to two, then you can take the fourth and you can go, you can combine that with the, the two outputs from the previous step and go from that to two. Uh, and you can continue that indefinitely, but once you're down to only two remaining things, you have to add them the old-fashioned way using carry propagate addition the way we've been doing it. Um, so that's going to be the basic approach. We're going to use this so-called three to two compressor, um, which you can probably see why it's called that. It goes from three operands to two operands. 
So you repeatedly use uh, this uh, 3D2 compressor until you're down to two things and there's nothing else remaining. And then you, you polish off, you finish off with our old fashioned adder, uh, carry propagate adder. So this is called a carry save adder. Our old fashioned kind of adder is called a CPA, a carry propagate adder. Um, and so that's the basic idea. Carry propagate adder. All right. <clears throat> so step one, let's simply uh, step one. Let's simply define CSA. Um, and and like I said, there's not really much to it. Um, uh, the main thing we're going to do is we're going to split out the bits. You, if if you did something like this, or add three, I guess uh, that would give you like a vector of pairs. You want a pair of vectors. You want to split out the S and C parts as independent vectors. So um, I guess that's maybe the main thing we're going to do, 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 do differently. So I'm going to do uh, add three of uh, X Y Z and um, and this is just going to no, like this. Um, or X and SIP XYZ. And then uh, the first output is going to be uh, the S part, and that's just going to be uh, just write it like this. So, so this is just splitting it apart into its two parts. So that's a carry save adder. And um, the invariant you want, like I mentioned, is uh, like that. Um, okay. Um, uh, so, let me, so let me define a function called add multiple. So this is the first way we're going to use it. Um, the first thing I'm going to show is called an array multiplier or a CSA array multiplier. And what it's just going to do is it's going to do this thing I just described in a very straightforward way on the partial product array. So you start with the first three things in the partial product array, you reduce it to two. Then you take the next partial product, you combine it with the two uh, SC outputs from the previous reduction and you know, and so on. And you continue that until you're done. And then you do a final carry propagate addition using this identity. Um, so that's a, an array. Uh, an array multiplier, carry save array multiplier, but I'm actually going to decompose that into a step that has nothing to do apparently with multiplication, which is just if I have a bunch of things I want to add in parallel, rather than doing it with a you know full carry propagate binary reduction tree or something like that, I can use this process I just described. Uh, so I will call this array multi adder, uh, and so uh, X this is going to be our array of operands. And um, basically what we're going to do is um, um, I guess maybe if we want to be kind of nice, we can have a few different cases. No, actually, I don't want to even do that because then I have to test the different cases for now. Let's just say you require there to be at least three things um, uh, in the array. So you start with... Uh, Start with the first three to initialize the iteration, uh, and then from there you simply um, you iterate through the remaining things. So starting at uh, index three, and then you CSA reduce like this, and then you have to finish off with a real propagate addition. So initialize the three to two compression uh, loop, basically the way I described it. Uh, gives you two outputs, and then for every uh, successive operand, we combine it with the previous SC to produce a new SC. And then we, once we're done, we still have two things we have to combine. This is a two-to-one compression step. We have to do that the old-fashioned way with uh, a uh, uh, a thing like this. So um, we can now use this 
to uh, we, we can use this to do the multiplier and uh, all we're going to do is uh, I'm going to call it array multi adder partial products of x's um, Here. Okay. Let's try making a test module for that. That's 34. Um, see if that works. I would say fat chance, but um, this is maybe a good opportunity to test some stuff. So this should be 3 times 3. Uh, And we're getting back seven. Yeah, I, I know about four to two compressors. Um, but for a, an array multiplier, this is actually, I think, well, th th this is not what you want to end up with anyway. You probably want a tree multiplier. That typically, uh, four to two is used for tree multipliers. Um, but I think if you're just doing an array uh, multiplier, this is probably uh, pretty regular. Um, all right, uh, so let's see where the bug is. Oh, I'm not shifting things. When, um, yeah, I'm not shifting things correctly. So when you get out these operands, um, keep in mind that C should be shifted conceptually relative to uh, the other operands. So I think when you add it in, you have to treat C as if it's been shifted uh, in this uh, combination step. And I guess you could actually just do that on, on this side here. Now that I think about it, um, if you just shift this thing, then you wouldn't, it's already been kind of accounted for in the waiting. Um, so this is probably the cleaner way to do it. Okay, so that works. I think this is probably the cleaner way to write it. So then we just, we, we pre-shift the, the second operand to account for the plus one weight, uh, and then no other people don't have to worry about it. Um, you know, and then you can even write it like, then you don't even have to think of them as being separate. Uh, well, then you can actually also write it like this. Um, let's see, x, y, and then c, and then you can just do x, y, z, x, y. And then this has to start at two if you do that. Right. Um, okay. I guess you can even do this with two. So, so that's an array multiplier. Let's look at what the uh, delay is. Um, so that would be 34, I guess. Let's have the old one as well. Just Okay, that's actually slower. Um, maybe because it's too narrow to really show the gains and the built-in adder is kind of unfair, I guess. Um, I mean, any kind of anything with quadratic growth is not really going to kick into gear. This really is slower for the second one. Um, I mean, it is an array multiplier, which is linear depth as well. So maybe it's going to be a smaller area. Let's see. So 33 and 34. I guess maybe that makes sense. It's because it's probably because, uh, well, 
let's try using a really naive adder for this, like a carry. Okay, so this gets even better. Is an add carry Oh, um, I want to fix this before we move on. There, there must be something silly. Uh, if I'm going to use these uh, admittedly unrealistic timing measurements, I at least want them to be somewhat in, in the realm, realm of reality. Um, it should be linear depth in this, and then uh, let's see. So up there I used Since we just carry, then I'll use the same thing down here for the final step. It's about double, that's interesting. It's probably the thing Fabian mentioned earlier. Um, Well, it's still linear depth. I think it's probably mostly, yeah. I mean, I, so I'd never really had, the, I, I never had a tool that could actually do timing analysis in order to contradict my simple-minded uh, mental models of, of this stuff. This was only a stepping stone to tree adders uh, or tree multipliers anyway. So we'll move to those in a sec. But um, let's, I guess, let, let's naively analyze where the time is going in this in terms of critical path. Um, there's the final adder, which if you make it fast, um, and, and, and let's just let's leave this here, and then uh, I'll use the built-in addition operation for this for both cases. Um, if you think about where the time is going for this, each CSA is constant delay. Um, where were we? Each CSA is constant delay, and there's n of them. So for an n bit product, there's n partial products. Uh, even though each CSA is constant depth, you still have to go through n of those layers. So it's linear It's linear depth, and then there's a final adder, which is however deep that adder is. That's a normal carry propagate adder. For the, uh, if you do the, um, if you do this stuff, well, here it's just doing a linear chaining, but if you do this, um, the, um, you have a logarithmic reduction tree, but each step is, you know, if you analyze it very naively, each step is linear. Uh, I guess it becomes log n squared or something like that if you use a logarithmic adder, and that's even analyzing it naively because there's log n sum reductions, and each of them with a fast adder would be log n. But I think it's actually a little bit better than that because effectively the different bits can kind of almost pipeline combinationally, like wave front sort of uh, propagate through. So it ends up being less than that because you don't have to wait for one operand to fully finish before you can uh, start computing the next as long as the lower bits are ready. So anyway, um, so yeah, so I guess this is actually not as, as slow as I expected. Uh, if you use a, a logarithmic depth uh, adder for each of the reduction steps, which is probably going to be pretty big and pretty irregular, uh, whereas the CSA array is going to be very regular in terms of a, of a layout. But um, but anyway, so let's uh, say that's an intermediate step. Um, we'll go back to the fast thing here. Um, and then while I'm actually testing stuff, let's go back to n equals four. All right. Um, so the, the next thing you can kind of do after this, I'm first going to so show the thing that's kind of I guess theoretically the simplest, but um, uh, it's not as much used in practice because it's a little bit irregular layout wise. But um, the next thing you can do is basically, rather than do each of these reductions um, in this, like if you look at what we're doing here for the step, even though CSA is constant depth for this operation, we're still doing what is basically a linear accumulation of these things. Um, and so, um, I'm going to show you what's called a Wallace tree multiplier, which is really a Wallace tree uh, multi-operand adder. 
And there's a slightly there's a variant of this that uses so-called four to two compressors rather than three to two compressors. But let me show you the version that uses three to two compressors, um, and uh, we'll we'll see if we can get that working. Um, so basically, the idea I'll just call it a Wallace multi adder. <laughs> the idea is we're going to um, we're going to have a bunch of. Okay, let me let me think about how I want to structure it. You're going to have a bunch of. You're going to basically treat the bits individually, the bits of the partial product. So rather than completely sort of treating a partial product as a single thing like we're doing up here, you're you're going to split it apart into the bits, and you're going to basically try to uh, join those together with CSAs, which are full adders. Uh, so that in, in order to avoid making the tree deeper than it needs to be. So at every step, basically, you try to pick, um, you try to pick things that are uh, of the right depth to be combined. So you mark every, uh, every partial product bit uh, gets put in a bag with every, all the other partial product bits. Uh, and each of them is marked with uh, an index I, which corresponds to the weight. So weight zero would be the lowest position. Weight one would be the next position after that. And then at every step, you're allowed to take three things from the bag. Um, you're, you're allowed to take three things from the bag of the same weight and then combine them with a CSA. Uh, and when you do that, it, it spits out two new things, one which has the same uh, weight I uh, as the uh, two bits out, I should say. So three bits in of, of the same weight um, and two bits out. Uh, and the first bit out has the same weight as the input. The next bit out has the the same weight as the input plus one. Um, and then the idea is basically, if you do this, you, you try to combine them in a way that avoids making the tree deeper than it needs to be. That's kind of the idea behind Wallace trees. Um, and so let's see if we can figure that out. So we're going to take, um, um, Well, actually, I guess here we just assume we have all the operands. So um, I'm just saying, going to say we have all the operands, uh, all the operand bits, and um, I guess we can put them. Uh, just put, let's put them in a big bag uh, to start with. So for x and x's, um, and then for uh, for b i in enumerate x's, uh, we're going to um, uh, we'll just call this B's for now. We're going to make this big bag of all the all the bits of the things we're adding indexed by um, indexed by their weight, their position, and the bit vector. And then repeatedly, we're going to um, let's see. We're going to proceed in phases, so that in phase one, we assume that all the input bits arrive at the same time. I guess that's a sort of implicit assumption behind this model. You assume all the bits are arriving at the same time, and so then there's sort of like phases essentially. Phase one, you pick, you you try to, um, um, is that the right way to formulate it? I've actually implemented it before, but maybe I'm trying to think if I want to do it differently. Um, Okay, so, so 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 say you do a, a let, let's do a, a wild true loop. Um, maybe uh, okay. Let's see. So what you want to do is you want to Go over each bit position. Um, so maybe I'll say this is sorted. Or maybe that doesn't really matter. Um, let me think. In a given phase, I guess it doesn't really matter if you process them in one way or the other. So maybe the way I'll do it is um, I'll have a dictionary and I'll call this pending. Um, 
myself. And then I'm going to, um, under the ice bed, I'm going to stick this thing. And, um, you know, uh, if I impending, then you append B to that. Otherwise, you make a new list that just contains B. So this is a list. Uh, this is a dictionary of arrays. That's and you could index. You could make this an array uh, rather than a which we call it rather than a dictionary. But I think this is maybe slightly easier. Um, and so you're going to pour all of these in. Um, and then I'm going to say for i and pending. So if there's an entry, there's going to be a bunch of bits in that position. Um, and as long as there are three bits in that position, we can basically reduce them. So, um, let's see. So we want to go through this vector, and we say at this step. Uh, if there are three things, at least three things left in this vector, um, um, if there are at least three things left in this vector, then we we do a CSA uh, we take these three things. I guess you can just put them into the CSA directly. Um, and I, I guess I'm going to do this in a sort of double buffered, or in a, let's call this next pending. Um, and uh, let me write a helper function here. Um, uh, uh, if I and D and D I append X, else D I is what it does. So then I can do this, and when I get these, I can put them in next pending. Uh, S gets put under I, um, C gets put under I plus one because it has weight one higher. Um, if there's only two elements, So I'll talk about the termination condition in a bit. Um, you can actually do do I have an add to I can refer to uh, some bit is that I'm just going to write it like this just so we have I'm going to write this like that. I'm going to write this like that. Um, it's going to be these two guys. So in this case, you're only using a half adder. It looks like you're not really doing anything, but what you are doing is essentially, if you didn't do anything with these bits in this layer of the of the tree, you you would just be idle. 
So if you don't care about area, you can make some progress. Really, all you're doing is you're pushing C one bit to the right or one bit to the left or something like that. You're really just sort of shoving it over one, uh, which by itself is a little bit of progress. And so this is really this step here is essentially, you know, from the perspective of if there's a bunch of layers, if there's two left over, you might as well do something with them, even if it's uh, not, you know, really reducing. It's reducing. It's reducing the number of things in this depth, or sorry, in this weight by one, because there's only one, you know, you have two things of depth i coming in, and you only have one of depth i going out. So you pushed one of them up to the next weight, um, but it's not a very big uh, progress compared to the other case. Um, and so um, if you don't have, if you, and, and then if you have a leftover, uh, then you basically just put, um, you, you just have to forward that thing verbatim. Uh, because we can't really make any progress uh, in this round. This is so you can think of each of this uh, as being a round, something like this. Um, so I think that's one round. Um, now for the termination condition, typically what you do is you do the same thing you did with a CSA, which is you want to basically wait until every every layer has at most two bits. Um, if if you get to the point where every uh, or sorry where every position has at most two bits, then you have um, something that you can combine with a carry propagate adder. So the termination condition is basically going to be if we ever get to a point where um, where we only have two things uh, per weight, then we finish. Uh, and the reason, but basically, is if we ever if 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 we we can actually keep using this thing here. Uh, or uh, or something like that to finish the vector off completely, but that actually degenerates into carry, ripple carry adder at that point if you analyze it. I think so. You want to stop early and use a fast carry propagate adder to finish off when you get to that point. Um, so anyway, uh, so once I guess we'll do it like this. So pending items. Um, then we have these reduction rounds. Um, and then we go to the next round. Um, at the start of every round, let's do the check. Um, Um, let's see. If any B's has a length which is greater than two, well, any B's, well, any B's has a length that's greater than two. We do another round. So that's the termination condition. Then once we get to this point, we have to do a conventional. Um, like we basically have to transpose this thing uh, and the way I'm going to do it is I'm going to um, um, let's see here Um, okay, let's say that you pass in N. Um, Let's say that you pass in n, uh, which is how many things you want. So it, it cuts off the vector at that point. And then what I'm going to say is each pending round is going to be um, n empty arrays. And we don't really have to do this part. Uh, Oh, 
it, maybe we'll still keep it. Um, and then this has to be an enumerate since we're no longer dealing with a dictionary. I don't know, actually, in this case, it does just order it directly over those bits. Um, but then here, it has to be an enumerate. Um, okay, so then at the point where we get to this, um, we're going to say for i b's in pending. So pending is the now the thing that is no longer pending really, we're, we're done. Um, then for the first operand, I'm going to say uh, b0 um, actually unconditionally. And then for y, I'm going to say uh, b's1 if, uh, if length b is uh, I guess greater than zero for b's impending. Because now we know there is at most two operands for each position. Um, I guess it's even possible that there's nothing here in a given position, although maybe that would be weird. Um, then we maybe write it more symmetrically. Um, so that's basically going to be it. This is basically just taking that pending thing and transposing it. So we're taking all of, uh, we're constructing a bit vector from, from what's there, or two bit vectors, and then we're combining them. And we could actually finish off, uh, it turns out, with, with this process. This will actually finish you off. Uh, it will just, uh, until you're down to one thing per layer, uh, it will just effect effectively, it will degenerate to a carry propagate or to a, a ripple carry type structure once it gets down to too few things to work on. Um, all right, this has low probability of working the first time, I think it's fair to say. So, um, whatever. I'll just read through it in my head, make these pending lists. Um, Oh, and then you can do it up here. So only if i is um, less than n do you put it in. So if you get bits that go uh, go out of the range we care about, you don't add them to the next round. Okay. Um, let's try to test that. on time. Um, oh, right. We have to, um, so, so what am I going to call it? Uh, I'm going to call this a Wallace tree multiplier. Maybe I'll call this a Wallace tree multi-adder. We have a Wallace tree multiplier. And it's basically just going to use the multi-adder with the partial products. Um, and we only want the lowest end bits. All oh, right, we need an else. Uh, so we put we put we put we just put zeros in that position if there's nothing in the vector. Um, interesting here. I is one. I 
I see. Okay, so I is the weight, K is the index. Okay, so let's see what pending is at this point. Pending, we're down to, you can see one, two, three, four, five, or there, there's almost two in every position. Um, okay, so those are just little bugs. Let's test this. This is where my the new debugging stuff I put in yesterday will probably come in handy because the chance of this working the first time is pretty slim, I think. Uh, and actually, even though I, I, I did a Wallace tree before, um, I didn't test it. I just convinced myself it worked. So we'll, 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 uh, we'll try try for reals now. Uh, is it 35? This laptop didn't work. I guess I just call it the right thing here. All right, this has to be marked as an output. I should have a warning when you forget to mark something as an output because that's a typo I've made repeatedly. All right, so we're already in the business of stuff that doesn't work here. So this should be this should be eight. So we're getting zero. Um, uh, before we get to that, let's just look at the graph because it might jump out. So 35. And with only four bits, honestly, there's kind of limited room for what can go wrong, I suppose. Um, so let's see, these are the partial products, one, two, three, four. Um, there's a bunch of zero bits that are going to make it into the multi-adder, which aren't really necessary, um, and you can call those out if uh, once you expand things down to the bit level, rather than just working with bit vectors, those will disappear in practice. Um, but anyway, then let's see. At the first layer, we're adding. Um, I see. So we split out these bit bits. So this is a bit vector for that partial product. So zero, one, two. So we add this to this to this, and that looks reasonable. And then for this one, we do this, 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 and these all have the same weight, and then. This is two, two, two. So, so far, so good. And then in the next layer, um, in the next layer, um, for the, I guess, the lowest position, the uh, index zero, we take uh, the output of this one, that's definitely a bug, because this one here should only get things of the same weight. All of these should have, oh no, that's not true, they're different, different bits, so let's see. This thing is weight zero, uh, weight two, and so the output here is weight two. 
this is weight 1 coming in, which means it's weight 2 coming out through C. And this is, I guess, weight 3. So this makes sense to me. And then for this one, um, for this one, let's see. Um, so this is weight 0 coming in. So this is weight 1. This is weight 1, and it also gets... If you shift this over by three, I mean, first of all, only really the top bit of this should have any involvement in anything. That seems wrong to me. Oh, it's because the partial products don't. Oh, they do have the right weights. They've been pre-shifted. Um. So this is weight zero. So why is a weight zero? Maybe I'm, um, oh no, weight one. Okay, sorry. It's just the wires were confusing. Hmm. This doesn't look obviously wrong. <coughs> These vectors were adding. Let me make sure I didn't screw up this one. So S is the XOR and C is the AND. Before I start just think through this. Um, actually, let me also to help this a little bit. Let's let's say that all these actually come in with weights um, attached, so we don't have to pre-shift them. Which, especially when you're doing things this way, it becomes cleaner to look at the graphs, and it's also more efficient. Uh, you don't have to optimize so much elsewhere. So then, uh, let's say everything comes in. And so let, let me call it weighted partial products. Um, partial products. 
So actually, let me define something called weighted partial products. And it's not going to be shifted. It's just going to be kind of weighted. And then um, to get back the original, um, you can basically uh, do it like this if you want to. Because then um, I can pass these weighted partial products to our Wallace tree thing to do. To see what that looks like now. <clears throat> Let me encapsulate the add to. Okay. Just so I can, the problem is if they get exploded into operands, then the graph will start splitting them out over across multiple layers, so it's harder to see what's going on. Um, okay. So we have this one, which handles So this up here, this is the top bit of that, and it's this ended with this, so this is weight 3, which means it's weight 3 in the output as well. But shouldn't there also be, like, for example, 2 plus 2? Partial product corresponding to two and two is where oh sorry it, it should be So this one is 0 and 3, and then the other one was 1 and 2. And the 2 and 1 is there. So that goes into this.
is this? So, so here is three one. Or sorry. Three zero two one one two two zero. Uh, yeah, it's it's all those. So this one comes from the okay. So that actually does look correct for the top bit, from what I can tell. Where's the specific failure case again? X and Y. Which is still within the range. P is five. I mean, I can try to use, so I was, I was going to be happy to show off the new debugging stuff, but unfortunately, I think for this specific problem, it's not going to be super informative, just because it's so hard to visualize, well, I guess you can use the graph maybe to get an idea for it, but it's hard to figure out exactly what these bits mean. Um, for example, um, We had to put in some debugging stuff. We have some round counter. Um, I didn't hook that up before. Actually, let me just do the pass through for this stuff. Um, so if I recursively call node operand, 
I think we need the trace nodes in the graph. It's probably more clutter than anything else. Okay, so now let's try tracing. Um, Provide some. So that does make sense. In the least significant position, because of the shifting, there's only one bit, and that just has to pass through. So you can't get any action in the first in the first column. Just be consistent. That's my two bit prints. Um. The reason we're not seeing the dot C's is because those are not, I guess, for this specific small n equals 4 case, they don't appear to play a role, which is curious because you would expect at least one of the carries to matter, like um, if you do, let me write it out here, x3, x1 x2, x1, x0, um, and then you have I think with flawless trees, you do have to wire it up at the individual bit level. At least I don't see a better way to do it. Um, let's see. So this gets passed through in round zero. Can you do it out of full word CSAs? Yes, you can. So let me just think through this case. I don't. I, I appreciate the the input, but I, I need to stay focused on this problem just for a sec. Um, so this is passed through. That makes sense. Then we get the uh, the add two output for this column, which also makes sense. Um, that potentially has a carry into the next position. In the next position, 
you have uh, you have three things. And so that's why you have an at three. Um, so that means you only have one here, and that, then you have the carry from the previous position. So that's why it stops after one round. That does make sense, because there's a carry, potential carry from this column, but this goes all the way from three to one thing in this column. So there's only two things remaining in this. Over here, there's... Uh, Just finish it off. So this is I3. Here there should be in round one there's a three to two which is what we see here and then one that gets passed through. So that leaves two things in this column. But there should also have been a carry from this which means it shouldn't I think there's there's something we haven't propagated here. <clears throat> because this thing can produce a carry. So there's that. Then there is this the output of this 3 to 2. So that's... And then there's a pass-through. So it shouldn't be able to finish in one round. I feel like it should need one more round. Um, actually, let me print each of the pendings. Right, so four in position three. Um, boom, 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 boom. Time I want to finish this before. Um, so this position, there is a, there is, there should be, um, there's a 3 to 2, which produces another result in the same way. And then there's one that's passed through. So that's 2. But there should also have been a carry from the previous position. Which was a, a 3 to 2 as well. Uh, 
Uh, Fabi's talking about an easier formulation that uses full word CSAs the way I did for the array multiplier. I actually don't know if you can do it that way. Uh, that's not the way it's usually explained. Um, and or the way I can think, like part of the reason I think you can, well, anyway, let me let me finish this even if it turns out to be the wrong formulation uh, or wrong in the sense of not the simplest because this seems like a, should be a simple bug. So why basically is this thing here not making it into the next column? So when I'm, when I have I equal to two, um, for this case here, I should do I plus one, which is three, and stick that in. Um, then this thing here, which is the three vacation, should stick something in as well. Now there's two elements. Then the pass through should also stick something through. Oh shit, I know what it is. Jesus Christ. This is the. Oh my god. Variable shadowing. At least. Okay, at least now we're getting to a second round. So if there's an issue, it's something else, which I appreciate. Uh, okay, now I'm confident that I can handle the rest because this was just an insane, um, an insane bug from variable shadowing. In case you didn't see, I had two things called n. And because of the way things work in Python, there's no real block scope. And so it just overwrote the binding even at this scope, or even at this scope up here, there's only function scope. This is a colossal language design error. Um, all right, so now sanity is restored. I can start thinking about what goes on here. So this is the reduction. So after this round, there should be one thing in this column. There should be uh, one thing here because there's no carry since we just passed that through. This thing, you get a three to two. So there's one here and then there's one that's propagated. So that should be two. And then for the next one, there's a three to two. There's one pass through that's two. And then there's one carry that's three. Um, and then finally, um, these bits all get passed through. Um, this thing here goes um, two to two, so one in the same position and one over. This goes three to two with one in, and so now we are two, and now we're done, and we should be able to uh, polish off that final step. Okay, that seems reasonable. Now I at least understand what's going on with the reduction tree. Now it's just a matter of whether we're doing the right thing in the reductions. Um, so let's look for this, this thing that's failing. Um,
So x, we're getting 14. Um, Um, let me just write these down. New window. Um, I'm looking. Uh, this is zero. Dun, 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 dun. All right. Um, and so Lowe's position in round zero. You pass through a zero. I guess that's right, because it's like x multiplied by 0. Um, the graph now that we fix that issue with the rounds. That's definitely a bug. Right? How can the same output be routed to two different positions? It happens here too. Okay, so that's the bug. That's why the graph is great. That should you cannot see any other way. S comma Z. What's going on here? I wonder if it's just a graph drawing bug. It's because of my trace nodes. Shit. Okay, so it's just trace nodes, but that's... Uh... Let me temporarily set it to... Uh, just the original without any tracing. Just while I'm looking at this shit. Yeah, except when the graph has bugs. Maybe it doesn't. Um... I mean, this is too weird. 
to really be a real thing. Um, this thing is getting hit, right? Yeah, so I'm just passing through the node. Oh, I see. God. Ah, I bet it works now. It fucking works, guys. It was my typo. It's always this shit. I hate programming sometimes. So let's review what the actual bugs were. It was a fucking variable shadowing bug, and it was me doing a copy and paste and forgetting to update this so that the trace was actually tracing through the wrong thing. Fucking kidding me. Yeah, this is this often feels like what programming is like, to be honest. Do some gif do some demotivational po poster worthy shit. So basically, it just straight up worked, except for things that are that really have nothing to do with the problem per se or the algorithm. All right. Well, welcome to programming. Oh, Jesus. Okay. <sighs> Deep breath. Anyway, I'm happy I fixed it. But actually, that graph was pretty, I don't know how I would have found that any other way, short of extremely kind of looking at traces, uh, like trace uh, data through a microscope. So even though I'm not, you know, I'm kind of starting to appreciate graphs from this stuff, being able to see this. All right. So that actually worked. <laughs> Let's try looking at um, what the depth is. Let's try ram up. Let's first try 16. Um, of course, the tests are not going to finish anywhere this side of the heat death of the universe, but um, let's just see what the depths are. All right. So we're already seeing some traction. Let's do a 64 bit. Where are we? Oh, I guess it's going to be quadratically sized, so this might take a while to construct. Yay! is faster. I think it's even faster than this indicates, but at least I showed you an actual asymptotic improvement. Well, not just asymptotic, actual improvement. Um, all right, I think this is probably enough for the stream because I'm kind of all worn out after that stupid debugging shit. Um... What was the fast adder? I'm trying to remember. All right. Um, yeah, let's let's say that's it for today. Um, I should mention. I, I guess maybe I'll return to this later. Um, there, there's a structure that people use in practice more uh, because it's much more layout friendly. Called, um, well, it's basically the same idea but using four to two uh, compressors. Um, and the reason people like that is like the layout is more regular and you get something that's an actual binary tree rather than, than this kind of weird thing that is sometimes three to two and sometimes doesn't do anything and so on. Um, so in practice, that's what people use. But I think 
the, the the idea of the Valus Wallace Tree Adder is still beautiful. Like regardless of the exact structure, the, the basic idea being that you do this. Uh, you know, it's like something we've seen before. It's this idea of some sort of logarithmic reduction. In the case of the Wall Street Adder, uh, Fabian was suggesting that you can do this as word level CSA the way we did it with the array multiplier. Last time I tried to figure out that formulation, I actually failed, and I couldn't find any in the literature either. But um, so as far as I know, uh, you kind of have to formulate it in order to get that parallelism uh, that's inherent in all these reductions. You have to formulate it at the bit level and track the weight as they propagate through the different rounds. But uh, maybe I'm wrong about that. But uh, you know, in any case, I think it's a beautiful idea, even if the um, the details were a little fiddly, but to be honest, I think the fiddliness was mostly an artifact of stupid programming bugs that didn't have much to do with the algorithm per se. Um, like if you think about it now that we we kind of know this works and we can pretend that it were you know that we that, that it's obvious that it worked and so on. Um, what what do we really have here? We have a set of successive rounds where we repeatedly make three to two reductions, two to two, but in different weights. Uh, or pass throughs and you keep doing that until you're down to a case that you can finish off with a CPA. So from from that perspective, it's a simple algorithm, right? Um, and again, it has some like the 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 the, the irregular tree structure makes it uh, not ideal for uh, for chip layout. Um, but as a as an abstract algorithm, I think it's a, it's a beautiful idea. And even the fancier, like the practical versions, essentially use the same idea, just with a more regular reduction. So anyway. Yeah, uh, so like Fabian says, uh, the other thing you do in practice is called uh, modified booth recoding. And I, I'll probably cover that actually, not just not right now, but modified booth recoding cuts down on the number of partial products by a factor of two. Um, so that's a, it, it doesn't help you go from, I mean, logarithmic is already as good as you're going to get, but it cuts off a big constant factor, and it also helps when you're doing sine extended multiplies. Uh, it, it gives an optimization for that. Um, and so if you look at, if you take a step back and look at what we did in our algorithm, there's basically three steps. There's the broadcast to generate the partial products. So that's a pretty big fan out operation. Uh, if you're doing a 64 bit multiplier, each bit has, uh, of the multiplicand has to be fanned out uh, 64 times. So even that may need a, probably needs a three layer fan out of four buffer tree just in order to get those out to the partial product bits. So you generate that partial product uh, array. Uh, the next step is a CSA reduction. And we used a, a Wallace tree. Uh, in practice, people use something based on four, four to two, uh, sorry, uh, four, yeah, four, four to two reductions rather than three to two reductions. But in any case, it's the same broad idea. It's a logarithmic reduction that decouples the carry chain from, from the different bits. Um, and then finally, we have a carry propagate addition. So the carry propagate is log in. The, um, the, um, the uh, Wallace tree reduction or your other CSA reduction is going to be log in. And the fan out is actually also log in because of the high fan out needing a tree probably, um, but it's a lower factor con uh, log in. Um, and so, you can kind of, I mean, this is not true at all, but if you think about why the latency of a 64-bit multiplier or something like that, you often see that being like four cycles for integers. Um, you can maybe get an idea of why that's possible, given that, you know, it, like it, it's not totally true that an, uh, that a 64-bit add takes a full cycle. There's obviously some time to spare, but you can kind of get an idea why it's a small multiple and why it's in that ballpark of three to four. Um, and that's very back of the envelope. But you you get an idea of why, you know, like basically this final step here is more or less a full addition. You can't really get around this. Uh, the vectors may be a little bit sparse, but you're more or less dealing with a full carry propagate addition. Then this previously here is not like a normal carry propagate, but it is sort of roughly logarithmic. And then the high high fan out partial product generation also logarithmic, but smaller constant factor, but but definitely not free either. Um, despite its simplicity. So anyway, uh, I, I guess the bottom line is I want you to understand why multiplies don't have that much more latency than adders if you use these sort of techniques. Um, the modified booth recoding is an important technique in practice, and I will cover it, but it's basically a constant factor on top of this. Um, that's the, the, I guess that's the take-home message. Um, but yeah, so that's, that's kind of... Uh, kind of magic if you come from a software world where you know um 
multiplications are if you want to synthesize arbitrary precision multiplications they're n squared and then in the width right even if you have word width uh, multiplications to work with here we're basically going to, to, to log depth but we're still dealing with at least uh, even the partial product array is uh, n squared right because you need every combination of, 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 of multiplier and multiplicand bits so even the, the product array is going to be n squared with a small constant factor so uh, th these things can get huge I mean, you, you saw how long it took to generate. Um, these things can get very large just because of the n-squared scaling, but this is a classic time versus space trade-off in, uh, in circuits. So, and I think this is really, like if you look at some of the adder stuff, most of the things we did, they had maybe a little bit more area cost, but they gave us a big speed up. Here you're really doing a serious, you know, uh, you know, you're really getting some bang for your buck by, by exploding the area a bit. So anyway, that's it for today. Uh, like I said, uh, I will be traveling in the next several days. I probably won't have a stream until next week. Um, I will be bringing at least one FPGA board to Denmark so that even when I'm there, we can hopefully start the more hands-on FPGA side of things. But um, in any case, we'll continue with hardware stuff for the next month or two in some, in some along some path. So I uh, hope people are enjoying this. This is pretty fun for me as well. So uh, I will be back next week and see you then.